welcome to the Pat Sheranian Show and my guest, Karen Gibson. Raise your hand, please. <laughs> There's Karen. And Mary Keith Boyack. Oh, as a matter of fact, Karen Keith Boyack. Exactly. Karen Keith Gibson. <laughs> Karen Keith Gibson. We're interchangeable. <laughs> <laughs> Is this any way to start out a show? <laughs> Let me start over. This is Mary Keith Boyack. This is Karen Keith Gibson. Gibson. And uh, they're going to be sharing some wonderful things with us this morning. But first, of course, I wanted to tell you a little bit about, Ka about Kayani. And uh, uh, be, even before that, I want to mention a show a program that's tomorrow at 8.30 registration. And it's for uh, Joy Bischoff's program that she's putting on. We've been talking about it all week. It's understandingnibbly at gmail.com. She still has a couple of seats left. It's $25 for the, it's about a half day program, actually three hours. And then that question and answer as long as uh, we have questions and answers. It's in North Provo. You have to email her at understandingnibbly at gmail.com and she'll get you in. $25, no children under 14. Give her an email and chat that way. Uh, speaking of chat, uh, you're on pat.utahvalleylive.com. And you can chat with us in a chat room. So if you have questions or comments for these ladies or for me, we'll make every attempt to answer them. You can make a comment. If it's really nice, uh, we'll, we'll be so grateful for that. Um, Kayani. Kayani has been a lifesaver for me. The products are amazing. And I decided today what I would do is, you've heard me talk about this now for a month and these products. So I want to just start with Sunrise, which we take in the morning an ounce. And there are nine reasons to take Sunrise. Maintains heart health, supports the immune system, encourages healthy digestion, promotes joint flexibility, enables effective stress management, helps maintain energy, supports cognitive function, promotes positive mental health, provides increased cellular support. And uh, the next break we take, I'm going to talk to you about nine reasons to take Nitro FX and Nitro Extreme. So you don't want to miss that because these are why I am so healthy. I was sick, sick, sick with diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol and crippling arthritis. I used to be a hand model. Look at that mess. And uh, But um, there's no pain. And there, is that a mess? That's a mess. You know, these hands are a mess now. But there's no pain, thank goodness, to these products. Uh, I can say that after 14 years, for the last 15 months, pain-free, more energy than I know what to do with. It may not even be legal to have this kind of energy at my age. And I love the products. I'm able to do things that I haven't done for years, like I was on the radio for 20 years. And uh, I'm back on. I thought I had retired, and now I've got energy I don't know what to do with. So here we are. For those of you listening on KHQN, thank you, 14 a.m., 1480 a.m., we appreciate your being there, and uh, if you're, you cross over, get on the internet, watch us, listen to us, go to the radio, we appreciate your being out there and would love to have your comments. Uh, if you are interested in uh, radio, as a matter of fact, I thought this morning with the three of us sitting here, knowing your history somewhat, and certainly mine, if somebody tells you when you're 55, you're going to retire in a few years, and maybe at 55 you do retire. Maybe you wait till you're 65 to retire. And maybe you still have things you want to do, but everybody's talked you out of it because you're too old. Don't you believe it. You've got a lot of life left in you yet, and if you've got dreams and things you want to do, go for it. In particular, if you're interested, I've always wanted to be on the radio, never had that opportunity, call me at 801 three six two nine five five two eight oh one three six two nine five five two i can talk to you about kayani i'll tell you secrets they're not going to tell you about both of them and i won't tell you anything about myself well that's not true we know that <laughs> <laughs> and i want to thank kent uh, vorkink and pete hansen for um they own uh, utah valley live and they keep us on the air we are in the process of moving up all night, moving furniture, for goodness sakes. And uh, we're going into a new location, downtown Provo. It'll be easy to find us. All right. Now, the Keith sisters, and I would like one of you to tell a little history because there's a whole bunch of Keith people. And, um, and you've all been uh, very uh, given significant contributions uh, to our neighborhood and to way beyond because they are very talented ladies. So this is the time to brag on yourselves. 
No, neither one of them are going to talk. So this <laughs> no, program. I'll talk. Oh, good. I thought they might. I'm going to tell <laughs> you about. Just a challenge. I'm this going morning. to tell you about Karen oh. because she won't tell about herself. But I think she was in fifth grade when she brought home a, a paper that she'd written for school, and I read it, and I said, "Oh, you're a writer, Karen. You're a writer." And I don't think I had any reason to say that for a lot of years until, now hold that thought. I want you to look right out at that camera sitting right in the middle of the floor. My brother-in-law was Max, our brother-in-law was Max Golightly, who was a great poet, writer, uh, playwright, and he was honored by the nation and a lot of other people. And probably one of the greatest readers. Oh yeah, great reader. Um, and one day I wrote a little poem about one of my kids and took it to him. And he said, you can write poetry. And he was very encouraging. Do this and this and this. In fact, why don't you come to our poetry meeting? So I did. And I started going to the poetry meeting. And then Karen moved back from Scottsdale, Arizona, where she had been vice president of diet centers for a number of years and said, I don't know anybody anymore. I don't have any friends and I said just follow me around I have a lot you can go to all my meetings and meet all my friends in fact tonight we're having poetry at my house you are this very night no I said that oh, this is in the okay. history <laughs> this goes well back. you were in you were five years old Karen was five years somebody and then you we covered a lot of years yeah there. No, right so okay. now we're up to uh, the beginning of our writing poetry so I had written a little bit and so Karen said, when I said, come to poetry tonight, Karen said, why don't you just shoot me in the head? <laughs> <laughs> That's how much That's she like looked forward to talking it. talking to each other. But she did come, and she did listen, and she was moved. And she went home and wrote her first real poem. And none of us, none of us get our very first poem published, but she did. And... Wait, what, what year was this? How old were you? Were you five or Hey, 10 you're the one 20? that published it. It was in the... In the LDS Digest. Do oh, you that's remember right. that? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Latter-day Women or LDS yeah. Di Digest, uh -huh. it appeared in there. Yeah. That was your very first That was, that was her very, very first, first. And thanks to Pat Sheranian. Well, that, that's sweet of you to say yeah. that. I didn't know that. Um, that would have been in the 80s? It would yes. have been, no. It was about 94, 90? 95. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. About 95. Well, good for me. Yeah. I did something really good. You did. <laughs> so, I, do you have it with you? Can you remember it? I don't have it with me. We should okay. have brought and it. I can't remember it. Okay. But, it, it, but she's got a lot of other things. Okay. We're going to get to can tell about. Good. And then our, well, we are four, we, in our family, we are eight. Four boys and four girls. And the four girls all ended up writing poetry. Our older sister, Beverly, was married to Max Golightly. And she wrote in a form, in a way, that no one else has ever written in. She'll be discovered in a couple of hundred years. Yes, <laughs> yes, and, and appreciated. But she would, she, her, her uh, poems were poems on the surface, but they were also word puzzles and three or four layers deep anyway so she didn't she she didn't hobnob with us as as uh, everyday down-to-earth poets anyway and our sister Helen who was between the two of us heard about Karen and I writing and having so much fun she says you can't do it without me <laughs> so, so well some of them would know Helen Keith Beeman yeah Helen Keith Beeman she was an actress, singer, dancer, everything, and uh, she was in a lot of the early films out at BYU Motion Picture films Studio. and in the the plays that were in town. Right. She was Dolly in Hello Dolly and Lola in Damn Yankees and Nancy and Oliver and goes on and on. Anyway, so she said, "I'm going to drop my PhD program." and start writing poetry with you girls. So she did very seriously, full time, until in 19, I mean in, uh, when was it, 2008, she was, she entered a manuscript in the manuscript contest for the state of Utah and won and was called Poet of the Year. 
hold it up high, for having <laughs> written Edges Disappear. And then six. What is it? Edges Disappear. Edges Disappear. Hold it up one more time. And it's by Helen Keith Beeman. Good. And then she suddenly, without any notice, died in April of this year. And we are very sad to not have her with us because she, we always, why don't you tell about how we got started uh, reading and stuff. Okay. All right. So I want to back up just a little bit before you jump into t starting about this because you've heard uh, Mary's been on the air with me before a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she has, after 25 years, gotten a wonderful book published called The, the uh, Code and the Crown. And, oh, good, you have it with you. Great. This is the story of Joseph out of Egypt, and it's um, it's true. It's uh, lifted out of the scriptures, but she has added a fiction to it to bring people alive, to make it so interesting you cannot put this book down. And uh, when it first went into Desert Book, it flew off the shelves, and it's still moving. And the exciting part about this, can I tell your age or not? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, she did work on it for many, many years to get it right. She writes everything longhand, like many writers and authors still do, in spite of the computer. Um, and she's now 80? 80, 80. 80. That's enough. That's enough? Okay, we're going to stop at 80. That's 80. it. And so, again, I'm going to say to you, if you've got things that you want to do, don't let anybody talk you out of it, because Mary struggled over the years. Uh, she put this away for a while and come back and put it away for a while. And then one day I took a long stick and threatened to hit her if she didn't get it published. <laughs> That's not true. But I did push her to get this thing finished and wrapped up so she could get it published. And it came out this past uh, spring. And uh, we're very excited about it. And please go in and look for it. It's on Amazon. It's in Desert Book. It's um, around town. You can find it. I think it's over at the BYU bookstore also. But being on Amazon, anybody can get it. So it's reasonably priced. Now, now you can talk a little bit. But before you even do that, let me say, they did that. Mary raising children. Uh, Mary is, had seven? Eight. Eight children. Karen, you have? I have five. Five. Mm -hmm. And so many grandchildren, great-grandchildren, we've all lost count. So, well, they haven't. But they, they just made time to do this, to, to write the poetry. It wasn't like they said, okay, we're going to walk away and we're not doing anything else. They, they had lives and they were very busy. So now the two of you start because you've done these seminars. I've sat through them and they're wonderful. You continue to be winners, both of you. Helen just knocked it out of the ballpark again and again. Are you going to read or what, what came, how, how come? You all were writing, but how did the book come about? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, we're going to have this now for the next 45 <laughs> minutes, these two things. Okay. It's typical, sisters. It's your turn, and Mary's the oldest, and so there I'm the you boss. go. <laughs> She's the boss. Only she really is. <laughs> um, Provo City asked us to read. We had been asked because they thought it was unique that three sisters wrote and read around. And so they asked us to read for Provo City down at the art center and we decided that we would put together all the poems we had written about our growing up about living in Alberta and Provo and we did we combined them and in chronological order and that was our first reading and afterward people came up and said we want the book we want the book we didn't have a book but we got a lot of spin-offs and invitations to read so Helen and Karen and I would go to all these clubs and places and read. And then we were asked to read in St. George at the Red Rock Writers Convention. And uh, one of our friends from Minnesota, who's now the poet laureate of Minnesota, was the guest speaker there. And he heard us read. And he came up after and didn't say anything but... Your turn. Where's your book? Where's your <laughs> book? Yeah. <laughs> And so we decided then, seriously, that we had to get it published. And our, our nephew is in the publishing printing business. And our niece helped. Lots of people helped. And Helen edited. And we came up with 
Bread and Milk and Music. And it was Karen's title for her manuscript that she was putting together, but she gave it to us because it suits it so well. You'll see. Karen, give that title again closer to the microphone, a little bit louder. It's Bread and Milk and Music, and I didn't just give it away. I used it first and won third in the same contest that my sister Helen had won first. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, so I'm waiting to win first. <laughs> As Mary said, Karen, you're the writer, and I haven't. Uh, That's anyway. right, she is. <laughs> she, she wrote the book. Helen got the book published. That's so great. I'm waiting. That is great. Well, now you're still writing, though, both of you. Yes? Yes. Mostly. Yes. In yes, fact, I think the reason. When I say writing, I'm talking now writing poetry. Yes. Yes. And do you still go to the retreats? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> That's wonderful, isn't oh, it? Tell yes. about the, the retreat. Uh, it is wonderful. We uh, have people come from? From Minnesota. All over. All over Utah, the country, all over. I heard. And, and they're wonderful people and wonderful poets. And when our brother-in-law got us interested in this, he said, you've got to go with me to a convention because the people you meet there are the greatest people in the world. And we found that to be true. They're the greatest people in the world and great poets one from, of the, from Utah. One of the things that Mary mentioned to me when she got back from this last convention, I said, well, how does this work? Because writing poetry on demand, I can't imagine. You know, it has to, I've written a few things and it kind of has to come and you have to have all these feelings. And Mary said, well, they give us a topic. And I didn't realize that's how it would be. They give you get a topic and then you write on it. Once in a while. Once well, in a while. well uh, at these retreats, Karen has done a lot of workshops and uh, writing exercises, and she seems to be able to get more out of people than almost anybody. Tell a little bit about what you've used, how you've used it. This was not on the list of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Which was left at home anyway, so... <laughs> One of our best ones, we got a lot of uh, contest winners out of it. I gave them the first line of a poem, and I wish I could remember which one it was. And they had to use that line and then finish the poem in their own words. And it turned out to be very successful. Yeah. But we, we just kind of have fun with it. So if we were having a little workshop here, can you think of a line for us? And uh, because we do have people listening on the radio, we do have people watching. And if something comes to mind that just to challenge people, just for fun, what might we do and to find out if we could do it? I mean, roses are red, violets are blue. You know, that's about where most of us stop. <laughs> that's just, exactly. <laughs> we start and stop there. Uh, I'll just take one of Mary's lines. Okay. Uh, it's from a poem called Grand Daddy Trout and the Four-Year-Old. And the, the first line to that is, my oldest brother knows everything. And so you would take that line and then write your own poem about to that line. Whatever. Whatever. So it could be my daddy. My no, mother. you have to use the first line. Oh, my you brother have to knows, use that. My brother knows everything. Okay. And then you, you write whatever you can comes from that. expand it to your family. Expand it. Okay. But you have to start with that. I exactly. think that's fun. And okay. it is fun. So what happens? You have, what, 20 people at this retreat? Mm -hmm. Usually between 10 and 15. Okay, no, um, 20. Sometimes 20. And when you have a national convention, is that considably more people or how? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's just our little retreat. Oh, okay. From that's our, our best friends from that are Utah. writers. Um, and you go south somewhere. And we go to Pine Valley, uh, Utah, and it's wonderful, and it's a four-day excursion oh really uh, i didn't realize it was four days yeah that and you just eat and sleep and and mostly and, eat and, <laughs> sleep and eat. write and write and poetry write. occasionally well so then do you in between the do meals. you share that with each other in kind of the raw state that it's yes. in and it is really raw and, and it's embarrassing and it's i was gonna say yeah no. wouldn't that be a little yes. intimidating and and this, mary's shaking her head no, no because they're so supportive and we're all in the same boat and such good input. Um, really good input. Uh, we have had a lot of winning poems come from that retreat. It sounds like there's a very high trust factor yes, between be. all of you. Mm -hmm. It is. And you've been meeting for how many years now? Well, that we just had our 11th uh, with that particular uh, anniversary. Group. Yeah, mm -hmm. our 11th uh -huh. meeting. And our so then year. when you have a national convention, do you have them in different places around the country? And who can come? 
anyone who wants to come be a member be a member of the first you have to start with a state association and okay then, and then be a national member can I give that information or who would they get in touch with or is there a phone number somewhere they could call for people that might want to become part of what you're doing we can tell about our local yeah about Utah mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We, we hold them, in fact, at my house. Oh, good. That's easy. You want to give your phone number? Will you answer the phone? <laughs> <laughs> I always answer the no, phone, No, I'm Pat. kidding about her cell phone. We have a running thing about her not answering her <laughs> cell phone, but she's always got it with her. Okay. 224-4172. I'm writing that down like and I don't know 801. It. 801. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so Mary will give you information about when the next meeting is coming up and how to get to her home, which we won't do that over the no. air. So, um, and, and really I do know these phone numbers and I'll tell you why, just insert here. I don't even know when it was, how many years ago. But um, these three sisters, along with some other members of their family, just simply adopted me. They decided I was going to be a sister. And so I kept being invited to baptisms and luncheons and birthday parties and whatever was happening and where you were reading and thank goodness it's been a rich wonderful relationship and uh, I did not have sisters growing up so this has been an exciting experience for me and the, they, there are so many of them that I've learned to say uh-huh okay yes you bet sure <laughs> <laughs> you can't, I can't say no I can't say no ever all right, now you're going to read for us a little bit? You bet. Can Mary just tell about our, when we get to go read our book? Oh, she was telling that. Okay, yeah. let's do that. And we just, we almost would pay somebody to call and say, will you come and read your book for us? <laughs> and since our sister Helen passed away in April, we've uh, persuaded, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, our younger brother Lon Enlisted. to come. Oh, I didn't know that. And I've reads, known Lon forever. And he's he, been reading with us. He reads Helen's poems. Uh, Lon has been around for a while. He's in my neighborhood. He's got a big family. Um, he has a group called the Buskers. They're entertainers and singers. They're coming here, right? Right. They're, we're going to start a family hour in the evening from 6 to 7, and we hope to have it ready to go by the 14th on a Monday night. And uh, they'll be in studio with us with whoever wants to sing, dance, tell a po read a poem. Or tell a story. They're going to be the family hour. Right. First I heard him say we can do as long as you want. I know, he <laughs> did. I, I go, like well, one. let's see if we can make it to midnight. Yeah. <laughs> I, I invited we... them to one of my sing-alongs, and three hours later, they were still singing along. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were the show. It was wonderful. <laughs> I've yeah. been one of those sing-alongs, mm. and they are fun. Yeah. They're really yeah. fun. And I would encourage families, and that's what we're going to do. And um, and have more people involved with us. We're going to have a different family hour with a different family every night of the week. Well, well that's five a nights good idea. Of the week. Yeah, I think we're going to do that, and then maybe shoot for a fireside on Sundays, Sunday afternoons or evenings. So, all right. Now, you're still doing this, and so if you would be interested in having this, uh, these folks read for you, entertain, because it's very entertaining. Do you add music? Because I remember when um, sometimes uh, one of the sisters played the piano for you, Uncle right? Vern. No, Uncle Vern played the piano for you, and uh, but it's very entertaining, and the hour just goes zip, and it's you know I can't believe you were sitting there for an hour. It's I think so it good. says right here that you can contact Karen at Mary's number. <laughs> at Mary's number. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay, the number to call if you would like to have these ladies for your at your library or home or church or wherever you would like to have them that's decent and warm with winter coming i know they'd be happy to be there call mary at 801-224-4172 224-4172 um let me take a little quick and say something about kyani right here okay. and then uh, you pick out the poems or what you want to do from here on and we're going to sell some books for you um, did we, we didn't talk about this yet. But we can do that later. Okay, so we're going to do this first then? Okay, great. So now I'm going to give you nine reasons to take Nitro FX, which I take extreme. It's a little bit stronger. It came out after this brochure was put together that I'm looking at. But the Nitro FX, this is what it will do for you, the Kayani. It helps improve circulation. Now pay, pay attention to that. Helps reduce inflammation, encourages heart health, 
improves sexual function, supports cognitive function, sustains the immune system, improves nitro absorption, nutrient absorption, encourages blood flow, promotes and increases energy. And I can tell you it's true. And Karen, what you were talking about a little bit earlier, it just opens everything up so that your body is healthy and you function the way you're supposed to. Um, I can't see that. Oh, oh, he's written a poem. Oh, he's written a poem. With our first All line. right. Yeah. Okay, read it. He's written a poem for us. If you on the radio wonder what we're doing, we're trying to look at a monitor here. Okay. My oldest brother knows everything. Here's a poem. That's that first line. Yeah. That's why I that's what I thought when I was to ten. Ten. I can't I can't read it. When I was ten. Okay. He fixed the car. Radio. Radio. And washing and was, machine. And washing machine. John even spoke fluent Hungarian. Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> That's a prize winner right there. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay, see, anybody can do anything. There you go. <laughs> if you try hard enough. All right, that's all I'm going to say about Kayani. Take it. I don't care what you've got. You're going to feel better, and there's a 100% <laughs> guarantee. And I got one more to talk about, and that's the sunset, and we'll get that in a little while. Okay. Okay, time is yours. Okay. We're going to read a few poems out of our book, Bread and Milk and Music, and I'm going to start with the first one in the book, and this is about our family and our experiences with our family, but this first one is my thoughts on how I would feel um, if I had to live in a polygamist setting. And we do come from a polygamous background a long, long time ago. Uh, and this is just my thoughts on how I would feel. And I just do want to say that the poems we're reading from this book are all called free verse. Instead of rhyming, you won't hear, hear any rhyming except internally. Uh, and one of the reasons is because I can't rhyme. <laughs> and the other is that we are three very um, independent spirits and we don't uh, do what we're told to do and so the free verse works real well for us and we can just be the free spirits we think we are so I'm starting with the first one it's called walking the salty sea this religion Young like the boy prophet declares a new order. God gives no reason in this season of budding. No whys. In 1849, Oliver is called. Eliza consents. She rides in the wagon with her husband and his soon-to-be second wife to this place, this valley, where Brigham will officiate. She wears her mended calico, worn and dreary as the endless days of July's untamed dust. Carrie, dressed in white, her youth blooming with each roll of the wheels, sits in the middle of the marriage. How long before she wilts like flowers on faded dresses, like flowers left too long on mounds sheltering loved ones, calendared too long on some forsaken plain. Cloaking sage and remnants of withered wheat, gloaming welcomes home the bonded threesome. Eliza bakes the cornbread, slices smoked ham, scrambles just gathered eggs. While they eat, she busies herself with discontented children, with chores content to wait. Suffocating silence boomerangs the log walls, rises to loft and back again. Dying candles create shadows, romance the room, shiver the anticipation. I'll milk now. Eliza treads dusk's fading trail to the cow shed. With her soiled apron, she wipes flushed cheeks, smothers escaping sobs. There, blanketed in black, she hangs hungry arms around the neck, nestles her head against the Guernsey coat and moans until the pain subsides. Ow. Mm -hmm. Oh, it hurts my heart. It does hurt. 
Oh, my goodness. And That's from, beautiful, Karen. From here on, we're talking Thank about you. our parents. And this is this next poem, Willie Brings Daddy Home, is when he was five years old. Do you want to read that, Karen? Uh, if, if that's Helen's. You, yeah, it's yours. It's hers. You better read that then. Oh, why? Well, because I can't see. <laughs> yeah, I know mine. <laughs> <laughs> Willie, barely five, shivers against the window, can feel drops splatter through the glass that shields him from the storm. Through rain and waviness of the panes, he sees a father robin shake away the wet, fluff wing feathers to cover nestled chicks. Mother bird hovers above, dives like lightning down then back. A worm dangles as she dances side to side on the branch. A scarf of clouds muffles day, stretches finger-like fringes to drench the earth. Mama lights the coal oil lamp. She waits, her back to the fire, strains toward the door whenever wagon wheels crunch the damp sand. Willie? Okay. His voice scratches like chalk on his slate. He hurries to get his coat that Mama cut down from Grandma's after she died, turned it inside out. Now the storms of all those years nib against his skin. Once outside, he leans into the rain, lets it sting his face, slows at Silver's beer hall, droplets sneak down his back. Those men aren't the same as at church. Their faces and red eyes, voices loud. They laugh as Big Will spins stories. Mama told Aunt Maddie, that's when his Irish shows. Willie strides in. Big Will jokes about him, tells a few more stories, gulps the brown, sour-smelling brew, hurls back words, Lil' man, one day, you all just watch, laughs his way out the door. Willie says he'll ride in the back of the wagon to keep the logs from shifting. He won't let his dad see him cry. The sharp ache of the razor's drop never hurt this much. Rain still slides down the sky. Mm. Mm. That was chills. Was by Helen. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's do uh, another Willie. You do this. I, I think one of the things that happens when we're listening to you. <clears throat> I don't know that my children would relate to this particularly, other than stories they've heard from me and from their grandmother. <clears throat> um, because the time is gone. It is. It is. And gone. it won't ever be like that again. Uh, we talk about milking cows and sitting in the back of a truck and and the dust flying up all over you and all of that and our children today do not experience that except through stories and how wonderful to have this poetry for your family and for others to enjoy yeah they're all little stories we can look back and say that was a dear time regardless of how difficult it is right. we can look back exactly and when we read some of the the places that we've been it's amazing how many people come up and say, that was my memory. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I did that. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it worthwhile. Right. This, this summer, I had an opportunity of visiting your farm where you girls were. The Penrod Homestead. Yeah, out the, in Alberta. The Alberta. Uh, hayride. Out there. And it was wonderful to see all those generations of children still on the same land. And so many animals. And they were walking around them and riding on them and everybody brought their own picnic kind of thing. I mean, there were hundreds yeah, and all related one way or another and saying to each other now, who are you and how are we related? <laughs> it was really fun. It reminded me of a, you know, a, a reunion I went to many years ago in South, in South Carolina. So a lot of feelings, yes. wonderful feelings. Okay. We could have gone back Willie. to North Carolina with you. That's where my daddy lived I didn't for a long that. time. That's really? what this one's about. Well, you, I'll read it. Yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> nine-year-old Willie, nine years old, rubs his toe across the knot worn smooth on the plank floor in front of the counter. He waits for Grandma's flower. Hey, Utah, how many wives has your daddy got? Mr. Cutchin's tobacco smoke billows, hangs where he wheezes it into the air. As he counts coins... He bellows like a barker at the carnival. 
teases folks from the corners to see the Mormon boy. Customers' laughter echoes his, bounce around shelves of calico and denim, tobacco, salt, liniment, and peppermint, barrels of pickles, crackers, dried corn. The stove with its empty belly echoes, the, echoes that pummel Willie's shrinking space. Asheville dust puffs between his toes as he ho hurries home to Grandma's house. Humid air, hang <coughs> air weighs him down like the sack of flour growing heavier, pressing on his heart. Carolina heat simmers the tears on his cheeks, penetrating, but not to February's grief, frozen in him like the Utah earth they hacked and hoed to dig his mama's grave. Aww. They do get happier. <laughs> <laughs> we need a happy one in yeah, here. Yeah, we do need. <laughs> you do mama's kiss. I'll do uh, my midwife. Okay. How's that? Okay. And my sister wrote this, and it's written in our mother's voice. So this is mama going through this experience. With her first child. Grandma, my midwife for Mama, May 1925. The moon, a silver apple, uh, rises full and fat. Before the sun goes down, Grandma night and sees it without even looking up. You'll have your baby tonight. Her midwife eyes pat my roundness, my full moon protruding under the folds of fabric. Well, I won't. Grandma walks down the sand hill in the high, bright gold of moon, arrives before the doctor. We didn't send for her. She knows when to come, what to ready. She cleans a second time as water boils, her herb tea brews, smooths blankets in the crib, rubs my feet, then supports my back. As the pains intensify, Dr. Curtis comes in time for the delivery. When he sees the baby's blue face, the cord braiding his neck, he sighs, sets him aside, and cares for me. Grandma shakes her head, moves quickly to the ten-pound baby, limp as yesterday's picked lilacs. Too big for your first and you weighing just a hundred pounds. Grandma breathes into his mouth, cleans and massages, as a cat licking life into her kittens, pays no attention when the doctor leaves, commands life into his lungs. Inky fingers turn pink, legs and feet kick into color. His face reddens as he crows and squawks, his greeting to life, then coos as she places him to my breast. She turns down the lamp, settles into the rocking chair, Thanks, dampen my cheeks. She'll stay until it's time to leave. Only she knows when that will be. Oh, Karen, that's beautiful. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay. Every mother, I don't care her age, yeah. can relate to that. Okay, this is, uh, now we're down to us. This is when I was uh, about four. Mary Bell! It's probably time for my dose of cod liver oil. I'd rather keep hopscotching. My lack of response to her call brings Mama to the yard, hands on hips. I decide I'll outrun her. Halfway across the newly plowed garden, she catches me. I didn't know mothers could run like that. <laughs> wow, what a woman. <laughs> <coughs> and she could, and she did. <laughs> Paste and ingenuity. Mama sits me down in front of a saucer that holds a bar of soap in a little water. After demonstrating how it works, she hands me an empty spool, wet on one end, suds, suds it up against the crystal white, then blows gently on the dry end until bubbles fly out. She teaches Beverly how to make doll furniture, roll back the flaps of cur lid boxes, cover with an old sock, fitting them until they resemble overstuffed couches and chairs. I'm delighted when Mama gives us a roll, roll end of old wallpaper. We make paste of flour and water, cut roses and leaves out of the print, glue them on paper, 
and fancy we have the most beautiful Valentines in town. <laughs> I love <laughs> that. <laughs> and we've all done that. Uh, we've all done that. <laughs> Let me take just a second <clears throat> and reintroduce these ladies to you. You're listening on KHQN AM 1480. And we appreciate your being here. And if you're watching us, you're on pat.utahvalleylive.com. Uh, we have Karen on the end, Karen uh, Keith Gibson, right. and Mary Keith Boyack. Uh, they are two of the three sisters that wrote these poems. Many of you know Helen Beeman from many films and stage productions in the Utah County area and way beyond. And uh, we are so grateful to have them here today. As you know, Friday has become our author's day, and uh, we all enjoy having those of you with great talent. You encourage us to try our hand. We certainly can feel our heart as we listen to you. We begin to have our own stirrings of remembrance. And so this is wonderful to experience. Okay, we've got uh, 20 more minutes, so let's have some okay. fun with that. I'll read two or three in a row because I'm born and she isn't yet. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the oldest sister, and you can determine that, so you go for it. <laughs> Granddaddy Trout and the four-year-old. My oldest brother knows everything, explores our world over, knows the ins and outs, even the outcrop of the stream ledge where da Granddaddy Trout lives. Enormous, as he shows wide measure of arms. When he tells us his plan, I am one of them. On this chosen day, I chase like a devoted pup after the other three down the path to the river's edge. We wade in, Alan gives orders. Beverly, you stand over there. Bill, you're next to me. I guard the rock. <laughs> okay now, be quiet, don't move. I hardly breathe. I'll show them they can count on me. Waiting forever, then edging out from the dark hole, a fish knows. He ventures more, then sensing boundary of legs, turns, darts, slices water, they reach and grab. He swims to me, right into my arms. I cradle the prize to my chest. He arches, flaps his tail, slides easily away. Vanishes ripple on ripple. Siblings groan. Lagging back up the path, I stop. Scuff dust with a determined toe. I'll never, never let another rainbow slip from my grasp. <laughs> And she hasn't. <laughs> and she hasn't. She's wrapped with <laughs> rainbows around her. <laughs> Billy Keith. Getting yelled at, spanked, sent to bed without supper, never dampens his recusant smile, his unflagging good nature. On this summer day, like many at the Brown House, Mama is wondering how she's going to feed her brood of six. Daddy's gone to Provo to look for work. Billy's shout brings us to the stoop. He points under the house. A white rabbit, a white rabbit. We often have jackrabbit for a meal, but we think albino will be a rare treat. To block the escape of our potential feast, Alan assigns watchers at either outlet. A lot of shouting, a few sightings, and suddenly the hare is there before Billy and me. My brother pounces, comes up with a prize, but also a piece of wood with a nail piercing his hand, pushing up skin on the top side. I don't remember dinner, but I'll never forget the nail print. Aww. Alan's in charge. Our parents have gone to Provo with Grandpa. They left the Model T at home. Alan, age 12, my Daniel Boone, knows the names of rocks, can tell us the varieties of lizards, find ground squirrels, prairie dogs, snakes. If he'd let me, I'd follow him on all his excursions. Today, he does. He includes us kids in on a conspiracy. He knows how to drive. We all pile in. To look grown up, Alan puts on Dad's hat. He takes the gravel road part way, then wheels out across the sagebrush. That's when Beverly starts screaming and doesn't stop. <laughs> We miss ditches, circle the haystacks. He shows us where he finds arrowheads and how the Indians chip them from flint. He puts the car back in its exact spot. It wasn't us that told on him. It was Mr. Miller, wondering why Dad looks so short. 
That's <laughs> darling. Let's tell folks where they can get these books. Can they? Is this still in public? Uh, being published? Oh yes, I think it's still in BYU Bookstore. BYU mm -hmm. Bookstore and, and uh, Sam Weller's and some in Mary's Garage. About a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> How much is this book? Every time we do a reading, we sell books. So good. They can call me. Do the, we know how much this is? Nineteen. The the paperbacks are ten. Are ten. And the no, the paperbacks are five, and the hardbacks are, are 10. ten. Karen lowered uh -huh. the price. Well, that's that is. I started to say that's a giveaway price for goodness sakes. Yeah. If you would like a copy, or if you would like these uh, sisters and their their youngest brother, the baby of the family, uh, to come and uh, put on a, a little evening for you and read, have a reading as they call it, then, or if you'd like to get a book, please call Mary at 801-224-4172, 224-4172. And uh, she's right in Provo. She can mail it to you. It would be the cost of the book and postage. But um, let us know. We'll be happy to send one to you. And uh, I think this is fun. And, and I, We've got I, to hurry. Do you, you girls have any area uh, that you're speaking in or reading, going to be reading for coming up? Um, I know I you can't think of any right things now. right before Christmas, but yeah. you haven't booked yeah. anything yet. Um, do you want to save some time to talk about the other two books here? Okay. We don't have much time. Uh, well, just cut um, that. I'm going, to read, I'm going to read the one about this one because... Okay, but save some time to talk about the okay. other two books. Okay. This is called So Happy You Came. Hmm. Oh. We don't have enough money. You can't go. From Grandma Keese, the others walk uptown to the Paramount Theater. I turn toward home on Fifth South. Daddy, seeing me, stops his Ford V8, lets me ride home on the running board. <laughs> we have something new, he smiles. What? A dog? A puppy? What? Shh. Mama smiles, folds down the blanket. It's love at first sight. We'll call her Karen. <laughs> it wasn't a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> I lose myself in her soft pinkness, armor from the stings of the world. Every day after fifth grade, Venice stands on the corner and talks with me. Tell me about your little sister. She knows I like to tell. Gates open, I spill. She's so smart, hides her shoes in the flower bin, remembers where everything is, picks out notes on the piano. Curly hair, sturdy little legs, called our calf Moo, because that's what her, its mother called it. Stories till dusk, armor from the stings of the world. Bob and I live in L.A. while he's in school. Karen comes to live nearby. We share cooking, eating, laughing, talking, movies, her humor and friendship, armor from the stings of the world. Needing refuge from everyday demands, I go to Karen's. Her patriarchal blessing truly tells she will make her home a heaven on earth. Come in. Here's a pillow. Take off your shoes. Let's talk. What can I get you? Sure, I'll listen to your poem. Armor from the Stings of the World. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, and now, it's true. How do you read after that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm fighting tears right along here. Oh, Karen, I've been on. in your home enough it. times to know that's how you are. Thank you, Y'all come on in. You've got to read yeah. this. If I didn't know better, I'd think you were raised in the Carolinas. <sighs> Page 26. Well, I was going to do this and let that milk one. and music. Do those, all three. You think? Yeah. And then I'll, maybe we'll have time for... The clock's in front of you. We stop at one? No, okay. we stop about five of. Oh, dear. Okay. okay. Go, Karen. Well, I, I'll just do eight loads and uh, we don't have time for any more. Okay. 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 We'll see. Eight loaves. I imagine I can smell it when I reach the vacant lot. Float on the aroma down the path, past Strong's, through the back door into the kitchen. Mother cuts the coveted heel, spreads it Grandma Knighton style, scrape off more than you put on. Then ceremoniously she places the prize in my hands. No one can duplicate the bread. I know why. One morning as the ritual began, I meticulously took notes, watched every move, counted the stirs, clicked a mental picture to pattern. Depression conscious, she added leftover mush, mixed it with the other ingredients as though it belonged. She needed like a champion boxer taking on his punching bag, 
with perfect rhythm, well-trained arms. Baking was the clincher, coal stove, blackened pans. I miss the bread. I miss the constancy of it, its goodness, its healing power. How could she have known as she went about her mundane chore what it would mean to us, her eight loaves of delicious children, stirred, kneaded, and baked, who live the legacy of Mama's bread? You have to I don't know how you can read these and not cry because we I'm do having every a time. <laughs> we, do, we don't. We've heard them about I, three you know, I'm times. thinking of my grandmother and my uh, okay. Can I do Land of Milk family growing think, up? I think you have time. Okay. We're all right. We're okay. Do uh, do pierce your ears and then the final one. Okay. We're listening to sisters decide what they're do what they're going to do after they got and here. And you can tell that I listen to her and I do whatever she says. That's right. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, funny. I don't know where it is. <laughs> and I, I guess while you're doing this, I would like to ask and will, do you have another book coming out? Have, are you oh, working I wish. now because you've both got so much poetry? Now that Helen's gone and uh, we are we are thinking, adjusting and, yeah, and yeah, figuring trying. out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And she's giving orders from where she is, you know. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Uh, our mother was just a little tiny thing, and uh, but she was strong and she was powerful, and we did what she said. And this is called "Don't Ever Pierce Your Ears." <laughs> <laughs> Mama said that a thousand times, maybe more. I asked her once if, absolutely not, she would never allow me to be seen with holes in my ears. People would label me a tramp. Worse. A carnival worker. It's true. <laughs> After that, every time I saw someone with <clears throat> pierced ears, gasps escaped my pursed lips. In high school, I knew she was right. Only the girls with peroxided hair who drank Coke for breakfast had pierced ears. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, friends succumbed to fashion, but not me. Helen defied the rule. Four daughters, and she was the bravest. And she was 40. Yeah, she was 40. <laughs> Before she she had her ears <laughs> Mama's wisdom willed to my three daughters fell on deaf ears. Using wily ways, they convinced their father to take them to the mall while I worked, then sashayed into my office, flaunting silver studs, decorating virgin earlobes. I was 50 when Mama died. On display, a sly smile on her lips. Friends and family filed by the matriarch. Below her quaffed hair, gold earrings dangled from pierced ears. <laughs> On your mother. Oh, my I mother. Love it. <laughs> oh, I remember my grandmother saying, you are never to pierce your ears. And if you wear lipstick before you're 16 or plastic shoes, you are surely a hussy. <laughs> <laughs> That's as good as a carnival worker. Maybe we can do both of, both of those. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. I'll do feeding the multitude and then you finish it up. Feeding the multitude, air stirs with hints of approaching frost. A few tenacious leaves cling where plump plums hung purple just against blue September just a week ago. I'm ready for that perfect moment when the first snap of turgid apple bursts in my mouth. I wipe my chin and wonder, will I ever get my fill of red and gold delicious? As I scan the orchard, assess my abundance, I hear again my father's words. It's a sin to let such good fruit go to waste. I remember how tirelessly he picked, how generously he shared. Try to follow his pattern, eat all I can, reach all I can, stock my cellar, beg anyone who will to come and pick. Still, great beauties already wrought underfoot, treetops hang heavy with unreachable plenty. Doing dishes at the sink, my window view takes in the orchard. First sprinkles of powdered sugar snow dust the ground, lighten branches where too many blessings begin to wrinkle, still dangle. Suddenly, a shadow across the sun draws my eyes to the sky. A multitude of starlings wave like a great scarf shaping itself to the wind. The cloud ebbs and flows and finally umbrellas my property descends and covers my trees like iron filings on magnets.
After pecking and gorging at some invisible command, the birds rise in concert and are again airborne. I laugh out loud, give wings to my guilt, and send it to fly with the flock. Oh, I uh, that's that. one of my favorite that's things great. ever. <clears throat> we had some wonderful times, and we had some tragic times. And what happens when we all get old is we die. And this is a poem about our father and uh, what a great man he was. Willie's Willow Song. Wearing an intricate weave of gold over jaded green, willows abide as the last bastion of hope for prolonging fall. Seasoned branches bend low, benevolently brush the ground, struggle against inevitable November. After a short sleep, they will be first to salute the spring. Dad was a willow, kin to trees he planted across the fertile Utah Valley. He stretched his autumn, accumulated todays, gathered his children in zealous arms. Nearly a century of circles marked his time when winter came. His generous heart yearned for home, but he wondered the how of no tomorrow. Shivering in cold air, lingering leaves fell from his tree, the passing easier than he could have imagined. When Daddy bowed to touch the earth goodbye, we heard the willows whisper through the moving air, Well done. Beautiful. I remember the first time I became aware of your dad over in the corner, and I think it was maybe an umbrella stand, were literally hundreds of walking canes uh -huh. carved that he had carved and then i came to your house and you had <laughs> a <equally> thousand more, <laughs> <many> more. <laughs> and apparently lonnie had some also everybody we had hundreds and all the grandchildren all, all these beautiful mm -hmm. canes they were smoothed and um just polished to almost shine and each one was different. There were no two alike. What right. kind of wood did he use? Any, just anything water, he could get his hands on. Whatever was out mm -hmm. there. He had been used to working so hard, and he couldn't just sit, so he started whittling. And he whittled all these walking canes, mm -hmm. hundreds. And anybody ever count how many? No. <laughs> no, but Lots. we're we're all, uh, we don't let them go. <laughs> you hang <laughs> on to them. give them away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they'll go generation to generation. But it was... It, it, was, it said something about him. He just didn't quit. He grew up working, and that's all he that's knew. That's all he knew. And as he got older, he was, I actually met him. In re, he was in retirement in American Fork, I think, was oh, it? In Lehigh. Lehigh. Mm -hmm. In Lehigh. And I went with, I think, both of you or one of you up to meet him, and a very interesting man. He was going to go out on his terms, and he did. He did. Beautiful. Do I have time to yeah. tell chocolate? Yeah, tell chocolate. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, it was two weeks two before minutes. he died, and it was our last visit with him at that place. And he said, I can't do it anymore. I said, what can't you do, Dad? I can't work anymore. And I said, you don't have to. He was, do 93. He, he was 93. He was 94. 94. <laughs> and uh, he'd lost his memory. And he said, but I've been thinking, if I can just work enough to make enough money to buy a pound of chocolate a month, I think I can get by. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah, a pound of chocolate a, a pound month. Of chocolate That'll a do month. it. Um, I, my guests today, of course, are wonderful. You've enjoyed that. And certainly, Karen, we appreciate your being here. Karen you. Keith Gibson and Mary Keith Boyack. Uh, these very talented sisters, uh, their books are available online uh, on Amazon. And uh, we, if you want to call Mary, she's got some. You can get them right away, 801-224-4172. And uh, I appreciate Kayani as our sponsor, and I didn't get to the very last thing, but we'll do it Monday. So be back on Monday. I've got a lot of new people coming aboard with me, and uh, have a great weekend. Be safe. Uh, we're going to have snow. There's a little weather report. It's been a nice breeze blowing today, but right in the Utah Valley area, we're going to get snow tonight. So be careful and be healthy.